God gathers us as a beachcomber gathers and marvels at every precious surviving piece of beach glass found. We are never alone. We are never lost to the one who searches for us and calls us his own. We affirm our commitment to be the body of Christ, to see and celebrate our unity, our diversity, and our shared journey of life in the spirit. We are broken, and yet we are made alive in Jesus Christ. Let us acknowledge our need for forgiveness and healing, and that the health of our minds deeply affects our physical and spiritual health. Let us pray. Creator God, whose spirit moves over the waters, you have gifted us with amazing minds capable of so many things. You gave us the ability to think and feel, imbuing us with discernment of thought and emotion. Like our physical bodies, sometimes this aspect of ourselves is beleaguered. 
We struggle under the strain of disappointment, despair, and delusion. Too often we hide this, afraid of what others might think of our difficulties in managing or moving forward, even in the face of devastating circumstances. Too often we perpetuate the stigma of a less than perfect state of mind by shaming ourselves and others. Misunderstanding compounds our fear. We label and belittle, all the while turning the hatred upon ourselves, for no one is immune from troubles of the mind at some point. So many are suffering now, O God, weary and distraught, grieving and at the end of their rope. We cannot fathom the proportions of loss, and so we look away, sometimes even from the need of our own community. Help us, Lord. Show us our capacity for compassion. Forgive our inattention. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Know this, you are accepted no matter what. Accepting the truth of our broken bodies and broken spirits is part of the journey of redemption. Sharing our stories of difficulty can in fact open the way for healing for you, for me, and for all.
reading this evening is from Matthew's Gospel, the ninth chapter. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done for you. And their eyes were opened. Then Jesus sternly ordered them, See that no one knows of this. But they went away and spread the news about him throughout that district. After they had gone away, a demoniac who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the one who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed and said, Never has anything like this been seen in Israel. This is the gospel of the Lord. At the beginning of my senior year in seminary, I enrolled in the clinical pastoral education course at Columbus Psychiatric Hospital. Clinical pastoral education, or CPE as we call it, is of a sort of education that is hands-on. It allows people to examine how the work of clinical settings can in fact give us the opportunity to stretch our ability to provide empathy and care and support to those who are ill, whose wounds are both visible and invisible, but also to use the occasion for self-examination as to how our work with those who are wounded, who are ill, sometimes terminally, how those particularities challenge us and how it is that we are able to maintain a sense of wholeness and integrity in providing care for those for whom the needs are great. And so it was that I enrolled at Columbus Psychiatric Hospital uh, to serve my CPE. And I did that largely because of the supervisor who had an excellent reputation for providing support and care and mentoring through what turned out to be a 20-week process for me. And so with some measure of fear and trepidation, I began my duties there as a chaplain. And I was there two or three afternoons a week apart from didactics and apart from opportunity for group conversation. And the whole experience absolutely opened my eyes to a different kind of wound. For those who had served in hospitals where the scars and the wounds were there and out and apparent to anyone who came into a room, there was at least the opportunity to identify quickly with what had been going on in the life of the patient, to respond accordingly, and then also to offer the gift of prayer and healing. But in serving in a psychiatric hospital, the wounds are so insidious and so hidden that sometimes it is difficult to be able to reach out in love to those who literally are trapped in their own minds. The whole experience was transformational for me. I believe that it gave me the sensitivities to be able to be a good pastor for those who had emotional and mental struggles because I'd seen it up close and I had seen it in residential patients and certainly have over the last 35 years seen it in other instances in every parish that I have been a part of. Our wounds are exterior and they are interior wounds but they are no less harmful than those that are exterior wounds with scars that perhaps are more evident. Perhaps even the mental scars are deeper in some ways. And most of the time, those who seek to live out their daily life with emotional struggles work overtime to keep it hidden. Because there is such stigma about mental illness and the difficulties of emotional stresses, especially in this time of COVID. In today's gospel, Jesus is invited into someone's house 
because there are two blind men who are crying out for healing. They rightly identify Jesus as the son of David and ask that they have their sight restored. What I think is intriguing and what I would like for you to also consider is that when Jesus offers the gift of healing to these two blind men, he enters a house. For Matthew, in Matthew's gospel, sometimes house simply means a residence, but sometimes house is a reference for a community of faith, a synagogue, and that these two men find themselves within the embrace of a community of faith says something interesting about Jesus' willingness to open their eyes. That he walked in and he said, do you believe that I can do this for you? And they say, yes, Lord and their sight is restored. Now Jesus leaves the house and he is on the journey and the crowds are following him and then he encounters a mute demoniac who also is one who is in need of healing. And Jesus offers that gift of healing by casting out the demon. Isn't it interesting that two men who are from inside the synagogue receive the gift of healing and yet one who is struggling with inner demons is standing outside of that community of faith. I think you see where I'm going with this. Too often still in this society of ours, we see people who wrestle with those inner demons and we sometimes leave them out of the support that they could be receiving from the community of faith mostly because we are uneducated and mostly because we perhaps are afraid of how it is that we will encounter that and what it is that we will do and how it is that we can care for those who are victimized by that particular illness. Illness does not necessarily need to be communal in order to be validated, but sometimes it can be invalidated by our silence. And so what may well be invisible to the eye is still illness. It is still brokenness. And illness of any sort still threatens to separate us from loved ones and the larger sense of community. Jesus touches. Jesus heals. Jesus takes our fragmented bodies and our fragmented spirits and gives us a sense of wholeness and peace that can only come by his gracious and loving word. The scars are not always visible. They are there no less. And the one who bears the scars of the world, the one whom we claim is our Lord and Savior, the one who has come to bring healing by being wounded with us, touches our wounds and brings healing and wholeness the wounds both hidden and those that are visible. Let us pray. Healer of our every ill, especially our malady of a troubled mind and spirit, we come before you to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to wholeness and grace. You have stamped each one of us as worthy. We give you thanks that your mercy is wide and your faithfulness to us not dependent upon anything we do or fail to do. Your gift of love and grace is sure. We pray especially for those who have experienced mental and emotional difficulties as a result of this past year of isolation and fear. We pray for those who feel far from hope, and we mourn those who could not find a lifeline to survive this hardship. We pray for those who find themselves without access to adequate care, someone to talk to, or appropriate resources to steady their hearts and minds. We give thanks for those who are telling their stories, showing us how to open our hearts to help others and offering ripples of healing in the community. We pray grateful thanks for those who reach out in love, 
first responders, counselors, doctors, all who listen and all who encourage. We ask for courage and compassion to those who have lost hope. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now go with confidence that the one who opens the eyes of the blind is already bringing light. That the one who loosens the tongues of those who have no power to speak for themselves brings freedom and truth. That the one who settles and calms troubled spirits is renewing, healing, and clarifying our lives. Recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in our ears. Do you believe it is possible? We believe, Lord. With God, all things are possible. Amen. Thank you.